Micro 7, three question warm up. Let's do this. First question, what substances do cytotoxic T cells and NK cells use to induce apoptosis in the cells infected with virus? So they use perforin and granzymes. Next, what highly damaging events can cause irreversible cell injury? Think about calcium influx, damage to the plasma membrane, rupture of the lysosome, mitochondrial permeability, and damage to the nucleus. And the last one, what ovarian tumor matches each of the following statements? Lined with fallopian tube-like epithelium is a serous cystadenoma. Ovarian tumor plus ascites plus hydrothorax, which we said is a pleural effusion, that's Meig's syndrome of ovarian fibroma. Call Exner bodies, or granuloma theca cell tumors. Multiple different tissue types is a teratoma. Elevated beta HCG is choriocarcinoma and also dysgerminoma, but primarily think about choriocarcinoma with that one. And resembles bladder epithelium is a Brenner tumor. All right, let's move on to the lecture. Hi, and welcome to our second lecture on gram-negative bacteria. There is just too much gram-negative fun to fit it all into one lecture, so here we go with part two. First, let's talk about E. coli. There are multiple different types of E. coli. The two that are most commonly seen on tests, enterotox enterotoxigenic E. coli and enterohemorrhagic E. coli. But there are a couple more that we need to talk about, so turn to your study guide and we'll go over them. Let's start with enterotoxigenic E. coli, or ETEC. This type causes watery diarrhea by making enterotoxins. It produces a heat labile enterotoxin and a heat stable enterotoxin. This heat labile toxin is similar to that seen with Vibrio cholerae, which we know results in that rice water diarrhea that cholera is known for. The heat labile enterotoxin does this by increasing the level of cyclic AMP in intestinal cells. This causes an increase in electrolyte secretion and decrease in electrolyte absorption. And this leads to a large amount of water secreted into the lumen of the intestine and voila, watery diarrhea. The heat stable toxin doesn't help matters at all. It stimulates that production of cyclic GMP in intestinal cells, which leads to that same result. Increased chloride secretion, decreased sodium chloride absorption, followed by a lot of water loss into the lumen of the intestine. And how does that end watery diarrhea? These toxins cause no fever and no bloody diarrhea because nothing is invading or destroying the intestinal wall. Now, we will talk about intro-invasive E. coli in a few minutes, and you can imagine that the story is a bit different with that one, but not this one. This one, intratoxigenic E. coli, is a very common cause of traveler's diarrhea, and this is why you have to be careful when, you, um, when you're eating and drinking, traveling in resource-poor regions. Episodes are often mild and self-limited, but in more severe episodes, we can use fluoroquinolones like ciprofloxacin or levofloxacin in adults and azithromycin in kids. Now, let's move on to a different type of E. coli, intrahemorrhagic E. coli or EHEC. One of the most common types, types in the U.S. is 0157H7. The infective dose for intratoxigenic E. coli is like 10 to the 8th or 10 to the 10th organisms. But for intrahemorrhagic E. coli, the infective dose is only 10 to 100 organisms. And that's it, 10 bacteria. So you can see how easily this could be spread. This type of E. coli is very serious and potentially deadly. What you need to remember about intrahemorrhagic E. coli is that it can, pr it can produce shiga toxin. This, um, it's this shiga toxin that causes vascular damage and results in bloody diarrhea and in hemolytic uremic syndrome, or HUS. HUS is a triad of symptoms, microangiopathic hemolytic anemia, thrombocytopenia, and acute renal failure. This is very, very, very bad and can lead to death. The major reservoir for this in the United States appears to be cattle. Even healthy cattle can carry this in their gut. And a little fecal contamination in one batch of ground beef can go a long way, especially when you only need 10 organisms to cause disease. And that's why it's very important to cook ground beef sufficiently. You can go from eating a hamburger to getting really ill in a very short part, period of time. Treatment is usually only supportive. Antibiotics haven't prove, proven uh, beneficial to clinical outcome in this situation. Okay, let's move on to intrapathogenic E. coli. Now this type attaches to the intestinal cell or the intracyte, and by doing this, it causes effacement. This attachment and effacement results in abnormal electrolyte and water secretion leading to diarrhea. There's no toxin production here to blame the diarrhea on. 
So what's interesting is that this type of E. coli is a huge problem for kids, but rarely for adults. It can cause a good bit of dehydration in kids and malnutrition in developing countries. Now let's talk about the last type of E. coli that we'll be covering, and this one is intro-invasive E. coli. This one is closely related to Shigella in that it invades the intestinal mucosa and can cause bloody diarrhea. Now you might be thinking, wait, we just talked about a different E. coli that was similar to Shigella and causes bloody diarrhea. Is Dr. Schufer just perseverating on this bloody diarrhea thing and repeating the same thing over and over? Oh no, I'm not crazy. I am fascinated by fecal microbiology, which you might think is crazy. But let me tell you the difference between these two Shigella-like E. coli types. The enterohemorrhagic E. coli I just talked about a few minutes ago does not invade the cell. It only attaches to the cell and then produces Shiga toxin. That Shiga toxin causes vascular damage and thus bloody diarrhea. In the case of intro-invasive E. coli, these bugs actually do invade the intracyte like Shigella does, and it causes bloody diarrhea by destroying the colonic epithelium, and that invasion of the wall also causes fever. Antibiotic therapy can help limit the duration of fever and diarrhea, though not usually by very much. When we treat, we will use um, things like fluoroquinolones, like ciprofloxacin, trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole, um, or azithromycin, um, those can also be effective. All of these choices depend on local resistance patterns, which are showing kind of frightening trends in most places. Okay, now let's talk about Shigella. I think we've um, already said enough about Shigella to give you an appropriate fear of this organism. So we've already mentioned that Shigella causes bloody diarrhea by two mechanisms. So do you remember those two mechanisms? One mechanism is actually by invading the colonic mucosa, causing inflammation and necrosis. And once it's invaded, it can travel from cell to adjacent cell, causing more inflammation and more necrosis. The second mechanism is by that Shiga toxin that Shigella dysenteriae produces. Remember, this toxin causes vascular inflammation of the colon as well as other sites in the body. It's a non-motile, non-lactose fermenting gram-negative rod that can be grown from stool culture. Shigella can be transmitted through direct person-to-person -person spread or from contaminated food and water. It's very infectious. You only need 10 Shigella organisms to cause dysentery. In medical school, I heard about this delivery truck driver who inadvertently spread it to a whole bunch of people who used his pen to sign for their packages. That's scary. It usually causes a small amount of bloody mucoid diarrhea along with fever, abdominal cramping, and tenesmus. In healthy people, symptoms don't usually last for more than about seven days. Treatment is often just supportive since the disease is usually self-limited in immunocompetent people, but antibiotics can decrease the duration of clinical illness and decrease the length of time that that bacteria is shed in the feces. So in elderly patients, severely ill patients, or those with immune compromise, we usually use fluoroquinolones in adults. Trimethoprim, sulfamethoxazole, or azithromycin are other possible treatments. Is this beginning to sound familiar? You should... Um, understand that these same treatments happen for a lot of these gram-negative diarrhea-causing uh, bugs. In these patients, you should avoid using anti-motility agents, and you need to tell food handlers, people that work at restaurants and such, not to work while their stool is culture positive. Shigella is just one more really good reason to wash your hands a lot. One other fact about Shigella that's going to come up in your training is that Shigella flexneri is associated with reactive arthritis. Okay, moving on to salmonella. Now, this is another gram-negative rod, another lactose non-fermenter, and another diarrhea causer, even bloody diarrhea. Um, but unlike Shigella, salmonella is motile. It has flagella. Salmonella infection can cause two different syndromes. The first is a typhoidal syndrome characterized by a systemic illness with very little diarrhea. This would be the category that typhoid fever falls into. Typhoid fever is caused by salmonella typhi. We usually see this in developing countries where it's spread by fecal contamination in food or water. And this disease causes fever that can lead to sepsis. The clinical feature that they might mention in a test question is sam salmon colored spots on the abdomen and trunk. So remember, salmon colored spots equals salmonella. The other clinical syndrome from salmonella infection is gastroenteritis, which is where that whole diarrhea angle comes in. In the United States, salmonella infection is often from exposure to chicken or eggs. 
Salmonella can actually enter the egg during development and survive within the egg, making any raw egg a potential exposure. The egg shells can also be contaminated with salmonella. So remember, raw chicken and raw eggs for salmonella. The other exposure risk that might come up on a test is handling reptiles. For example, a question might mention that a small diarrhea outbreak occurred at a daycare center where they were all playing with turtles. If there are reptiles being handled before a case of diarrhea, think salmonella. There's usually a one to three day incubation period for salmonella, so this is not something that will cause symptoms within a few hours. Staph aureus, which is not a gram-negative rod, can cause abdominal pain and vomiting within a few hours of ingestion because its mechanism of action is a preformed toxin. But salmonella needs a little more time. So how do we di diagnose salmonella gastroenteritis? Once again, it would be a stool culture. Treatment of salmonella is similar to what we've already seen with other bacterial diarrheal illnesses. Salmonella gastroenteritis is self-limited, and in otherwise healthy adults, it, um, they don't need treatment, and antibiotic therapy has not been found to improve outcomes, so supportive care is what's really necessary there. However, in severely ill patients or those with a really high fever, antibiotics may be useful. Again, fluoroquinolones are first-line agents. Now, sometimes salmonella gastroenteritis can get complicated. For example, sometimes salmonella can spread hematogenously and cause endocarditis and mycotic aneurysms. It can also cause osteomyelitis in sickle cell patients. So if you get a question about osteomyelitis in a sickle cell patient, salmonella needs to pop into your brain. The other association you might want to remember is reactive arthritis. Okay, on to Campylobacter. Campylobacter is a gram-negative rod that is S-shaped and is oxidase positive. Campylobacter juni grows at 42 degrees Celsius, so that's a little bit higher than average, so remember that about Campylobacter. Remember that it likes that hot campfire. This is another cause of inflammatory diarrhea, like Shigella and Salmonella, and like those other diarrheal illnesses, Campylobacter gastroenteritis can also be associated with bloody diarrhea. Like Salmonella, Campylobacter is associated with poultry. There is a huge, huge problem with Campylobacter contamination of retail poultry in the United States, making it a major cause of foodborne illness here. It has about a two to five day incubation. For treatment, like others that we've talked about, Campylobacter gastroenteritis is self-limited. So treatment is usually um, just limited to very severe illness or high-risk patients, like immunocompromised patients or elderly patients. If you do treat, fluoroquinolones or azithromycin are recommended. Campylobacter has also been associated with reactive arthritis. And which other bacteria did we just mention that were associated with reactive arthritis? We mentioned both Shigella and Salmonella. The other association that you'll want to remember for Campylobacter is Guillain-Barre syndrome. Okay, let's talk about yet another cause of bloody diarrhea, Yersinia enterocolitica. This is a gram-negative coccobacillus. This is usually transmitted from contaminated food like under, undercooked pork. But there has been some transmission from exposure to household pets as well. Incubation is four to six days and usually causes diarrhea that's indistinguishable from other diarrheal illnesses. One important syndrome to remember with Yersinia is pseudoappendicitis. Yersinia infection can um, cause mesenteric adenitis and a lot of right lower quadrant pain, which leads to the misdiagnosis of appendicitis and not infrequently to appendectomy. Treatment is supportive for mild cases. Fluoroquinolones or trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole is recommended when treatment is required. Now let's talk about Vibrio cholerae. As you can see on your gram-negative algorithm, this is a gram-negative rod that's shaped like a comma, is oxidase positive, and grows in an alkaline media. What the algorithm doesn't tell you is that it's modal. It has flagellum. And now this gram-negative rod is important because it it's the one that causes cholera, which kills about 100,000 people every year. Cholera is characterized by profuse secretory diarrhea. People can actually go into hypovolemic shock in 24 hours because of the massive fluid loss that occurs. The diarrhea is referred to as rice water diarrhea because it basically looks like that water that after you've washed rice in it. Now, we mentioned this earlier when we were discussing enterotoxigenic E. coli, but let's review it again here. Vibrio cholerae produces a heat labile toxin which activates cyclic AMP. This leads to chloride secretion and eventual loss of large amounts of electrolytes in water. Mortality is high with this illness because of that severe dehydration that occurs. So treatment is aggressive oral rehydration. 
The spread is through contaminated food and water. The good news is that it takes quite a high inoculum to infect a person, like 10 to the eighth organisms. The bad news is that someone with severe infection puts out this many bacteria in every milliliter of stool. Okay. Now we're moving on to something a little bit different. Let's talk about Klebsiella pneumoniae. Klebsiella pneumoniae is a gram-negative lactose-fermenting bacteria that's normal gut flora. It causes a lot of nosocomial infections, though. It also causes infections in diabetic patients and in those with immune problems. We especially see Klebsiella pneumoniae causing hospital-acquired pneumonia and urinary tract infections. The other clinical syndrome I want you to remember for Klebsiella pneumoniae is pneumonia in alcoholics and COPD patients. The clue that you should look for in a test question is current jelly sputum, which is thick red sputum, indicative of that inflammation and necrosis that Klebsiella can cause in infected lung tissue. Now for the last gram-negative organisms that we'll be discussing in this session, Proteus mirabilis and Proteus vulgaris. Proteus does not ferment lactose. One microbiological clue to further identify this lactose negative gram negative rod is its motility. Proteus colonies can swarm an auger plate and obscure other bacteria that are trying to grow there. Another microbiological clue is, that's important to remember for Proteus is its secretion of urease. Urease can hydrolyze urea into ammonia. So protease in the urinary tract can make the urine alkaline. This alkaline environment promotes formation of struvite stones, which can coalesce to form large staghorn calculi in the renal pelvis, as seen in this image. These staghorn calculi can cause obstruction of urine, which further promotes proteus growth, which increases the secretion of urease, which increases the alkalinity and further enhances stone formation. So you can see how this just turns into a vicious cycle that can actually destroy a kidney. So remember, proteus, urease, and struvite stones. All right, we've reached the end of the second gram negative lecture. Now it's time for the end of session quiz. So go ahead and turn off your video, answer the end of session quiz questions, and then turn back on the video so that we can go through the answers together. All right, which form of E. coli causes hemolytic uremic syndrome? Remember, enterohemorrhagic E. coli, especially E. coli 0157H7. What infectious agent most likely corresponds to the following statement? Diarrhea caused by gram-negative non-motile organism that does not ferment lactose. This is Shigella. Rice water stools. This is classic for Vibrio cholerae, but remember that enterotoxigenic E. coli has a similar heat labile toxin mediating its diarrhea, so it would probably look very much the same. Diarrhea caused by an S-shaped organism. That's Campylobacter. Diarrhea transmitted from a household pet. Two gram-negative rods from our discussion will fit here. It could be either Yersinia intracolytica or Salmonella. Remember Salmonella from reptiles. Diarrhea caused by gram-negative motile organism that does not ferment lactose. Now this one is salmonella. The most common cause of traveler's diarrhea, enterotoxigenic E. coli. Bloody diarrhea from eating undercooked hamburger meat. This is E. coli 0157H7. Diarrhea and right lower quadrant pain mimicking appendicitis is Yersinia. Diarrhea from consuming eggs or handling raw chicken. Now there are two organisms that fit this description. It could be salmonella or campylobacter. Please don't forget either one of these. They're both really important. Osteomyelitis in a sickle cell patient, you have to think of salmonella here. All right, that is the end of our end of session quiz. I'll see you next time. Let's paint some pathogens today. I love all of God's creatures, not just the cute cuddly ones either. Who's to say that bacteria aren't cute? I'll bet their moms think they're cute. So let's start with Vibrio and Campylobacter. It's easy to get these mixed up because they're both curvy bacilli. People want to sometimes describe them as C-shaped or S-shaped or sometimes comma-shaped, but that's not quite right. Let's start with Vibrio. It's a gram negative, so let's take our fan brush and we'll start with some alizarin crimson and we'll mix in a little bit of liquid white, give it a nice warm pinkish color. There we are. Now Vibrio species are slightly curved rods, not really C-shaped, just slightly curved, just a little bit bendy. Some of them might be bent more than others, but you get the idea, just a gentle bend. And then Vibrio have this nice long flagellum at one end. He uses that to get around in the Petri dish or in your colon, wherever he happens to be. 
So maybe in our world, there's a happy little flagellum that lives right there. What do you say? You get to put him wherever you want. It's your painting. So that's our little friend Vibrio. Just a slightly curved bacillus with a nice long flagellum. So pretty. Not so pretty if you happen to be dying of cholera, but pretty enough to look at. Maybe next time we'll paint some rice water stools, but not today. I'll have to order some more Van Dyke Brown first. Now let's compare Vibrio to Campylobacter. Remember, some people will try to call this one comma shaped too, or maybe S shaped, but don't be fooled. Campylo means twisted or bent or crooked. So Campylobacter is a twisted bacteria, like a spiral or a corkscrew. Now, that means when you look at him two-dimensionally, he might look like a C, or maybe like an S or a Z. But remember, he's like a little spiral. And then he's got a little flagellum too, just like our Vibrio. There. He's a friendly little bugger, that Campylobacter. There's nothing wrong with having bacteria for friends. 